Good morning and welcome to Glasgow Science Centre's Curious About Our Planet Digital Science Festival. Today we are joined by Rona Kent from WWF UK who's going to be talking to us about technology and how it can be used to reduce human wildlife conflict in the Arctic. After the presentation you can ask any questions you want about Rona's career or her experiences so leave a comment in the YouTube live stream and we'll hopefully hopefully get around to as many as we can after the presentation but for now let's have a look at Rona's presentation. My name is Rona Kent. I'm a polar ocean specialist with WWF UK. I have a background in marine and freshwater biology and I previously worked as a fisheries scientist and marine protected areas policy officer. I will be focusing on human and wildlife conflict in the Arctic, but I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to the, both of the polar regions. So here you can see this is the Arctic. The Arctic is in the Northern Hemisphere and is an ocean surrounded by land. The Arctic Ocean is the world's smallest ocean at around 5 million kilometres squared. The countries that surround the Arctic Ocean are the USA, Canada, Greenland, Norway and Russia. Sweden and Finland also have Arctic terrestrial regions. Antarctica, as you can see on this side here, is in the Southern Hemisphere and is a continent surrounded by the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is one of the world's largest oceans and it is nearly 32 million kilometres squared, which means that the whole of the UK could fit into the Southern Ocean 131 times. So the polar regions are really special because they help to maintain the balance of life on Earth. Polar waters regulate ocean temperatures around the world because cold polar water is moved by oceanic currents to warmer regions, keeping temperatures in those regions at habitable levels. Sea ice reflects the sun's rays, keeping the climate in balance. As climate change causes temperatures to rise and the ice to melt, this function is at risk. Melting sea ice and glaciers are also causing sea levels to rise impacting on our coastal habitats in the polar regions and elsewhere. A number of species and um, habitats store vast amounts of carbon. Generally, the global ocean has been acting as a buffer to climate change, absorbing over 90% of the heat and a third of the carbon dioxide humans have ever created. And um, as mentioned, there are a number of species and habitats that can um, absorb that carbon, removing it from the atmosphere and lessening its impact. As these habitats and species are changing and disappearing due to warming temperatures, carbon uptake is now being limited and the carbon already stored is at danger of being released. There are a number of endemic species which are specially adapted to living at the poles. Endemic means that they are not found anywhere else on the planet. So for example, there are over 9,000 endemic species found in Antarctica. So let's take a look at some of these amazing species. So this is the Antarctic. So the most important uh, animal that you'll find in Antarctica is this small one here. It's called Antarctic krill. Um, all of the animals that live in Antarctica depend on krill, either because they eat it themselves or they eat something else that eats the krill. So it's really it's the most important species on the whole slide. So down here we've got our crab eater seal, which despite its name does not eat crabs, it actually eats the krill here that we just spoke about. There are six species of seal in total found in Antarctica. This uh, fish here is called a toothfish. There are two species in Antarctica with, that are both um, commercially fished and they have developed antifreeze bodies in their blood to stop it from freezing in the cold water in the Southern Ocean, which is pretty amazing. So up here we have orca whales. They are found in other places, including off the coast of Scotland. But there, there is a group in Antarctica that has specially adapted 
to eating the fish that you only find in the Antarctic, such as the toothfish. So we've got the wandering albatross, are the largest of all seabirds. With wingspans of up to 3.5 metres, they can cover large distances when foraging for food, sometimes flying over 1,000 miles in one day. That's the same as a return trip from London to Edinburgh and back again. And we also have our penguins here. We've got a couple of species here. So they are, there are 18 species of penguin in the world, and they're all found in the Southern Hemisphere, apart from the Galapagos penguin. Five penguin species breed in Antarctica. So here we have our emperor penguins and gentoo penguins as two examples. So, and moving to the Arctic, we've got our walrus up here. So both male and female walruses have large tusks, where you might think normally it would only be the males that would have tusks, which it is in other species. So these are used for fighting defence and to help them haul out or pull themselves out onto the ice. This is a narwhal down here. Sailors used to think that they were unicorns because of their, the, their large tooth here. Uh, the tusk is actually a large tooth. And recent research indicates that it's used to stun fish to make them easier to catch and eat. This is an Arctic cod related to the Atlantic cod found in Scottish waters, and it is an important food source for animals such as the narwhal. Here we have our Arctic tern. This is, this is the longest migration in the animal kingdom flying around the world throughout the year to experience summer in both the northern and southern hemispheres which I think is quite a good idea. And up here we have our polar bears, of course. This is the largest land carnivore and they eat mostly seals. Its Latin name is Ursus maritimus, which means the maritime bear, because they spend a lot of their lives on the sea ice and enjoy swimming. I'll be speaking about them a lot more later on. Unlike Antarctica, with no resident human population, people have been living in the Arctic for hundreds of years. Currently, there's estimated to be over 4 million people living in Arctic communities. The location of these communities can be seen on the map. Um, unfortunately, it's not very clear, but this is really just to give you an idea of how many there are and where the locations of the communities are. Unfortunately, both polar regions, including the species and people that live there, are, increase, are increasingly impacted by climate change. This map shows the changes in surface temperature of the Earth from the 1800s to 2019. The redder areas show the places that have been warming the most over time. So that is it's showing the change in the temperature rather than the actual surface temperature. And um, so as you can see, as it gets closer up to 2019, uh, the Arctic, which is along the top here, and parts of Antarctica have been warming the most, more than anywhere else on the planet. The changing climate and resulting increasing temperatures mean that Arctic communities are seeing their homes and infrastructure, that is their roads and railways, become unsuitable or washed into the sea as the ground underneath them thaws or it changes. As well as climate change impacts, there are a number of direct human activities having an impact in the earth. So we have commercial fishing takes place, oil and gas exploration, 21.7% of proven global reserves of gas and 5.3% of oil are found in the Arctic. Mining, 40% of the world's palladium and 15% of the world's platinum, as well as 21% of global gem quality diamonds are estimated to be in the Arctic. We also have shipping activity and tourism. So what happens at the polar regions doesn't stay at the polar regions, it impacts us all. Scotland is one of the Arctic's closest neighbours and what happens there impacts on us and the actions we take in Scotland impact on the Arctic. As well as impacting on the communities, climate change and human activity are impacting Arctic wildlife, particularly polar bears. The Arctic communities mostly live in harmony with nature, but incidents of human wildlife conflict are becoming more 
consistent with the changing landscape. As I mentioned, polar bears rely on a diet of seals that they hunt on the sea ice. As this ice is disappearing due to warming temperatures, the polar bears are spending more time on land looking for food. And they're becoming more desperate when they can't find their natural food source. This is bringing them into closer contact with humans that live in the Arctic as they search for something to eat. Unfortunately, this causes a very dangerous situation for both the people and the bears because even though they look really cute, they're um, apex predators who see the people as food and people often have to shoot the bears in order to keep their community safe. So WWF are taking a number of actions to help prevent these interactions between people and bears. We are addressing climate change by supporting research on climate change effects and funding research and analysis on alternative energy. We are protecting critical habitat by supporting research to identify high value habitat areas, that is areas where the bears feed, den and give birth, and work with partners to conserve these areas. For example, WWF advocated for the creation of the Polar Bear Pass National Wildlife Area in Canada's High Arctic. We are reducing industrial impacts. WWF's goal is to ensure that whatever development takes place in the Arctic is sustainable and that it does not damage wildlife populations and ecosystems. So we work with companies and governments to promote sustainable activities. We promote sustainable tourism. Tourism is an important source of income for the people that live in the Arctic, but it must be done sustainably. WWF produced a set of principles for Arctic tourism in partnership with the tour operators. Creating safer communities. WWF has a variety of locally led initiatives to help reduce conflict between people and bears. For example, in Northern Canada, we provided steel food storage containers so that the local people can continue to store their food outside, but it protects it from the bears who come looking for east. Um, and in Russia, Canada and Greenland, WWF support community polar bear patrols. That is a group of people who go out and detect and scare off the bears before they come too close into populated areas. We also support polar bear research. No one knows for certain how many bears are left in the Arctic. Uh, the best estimate is between 22 to 31,000. So if we want to build meaningful management plans for polar bear conservation, we need to know more about them. That is their biology and their behaviour. So for over 15 years, WWF has supported the Polar Bear Tracker Project to gather biological and genetic information about the bears and then to track some of them by satellite. So satellite tracking is an important tool and here is a short video just to give you an idea about what the tagging entails. The researchers in the field, they encounter a polar bear, they take the measurements, they weigh the polar bear, they put on the female a satellite collar so we can track them throughout the year and they mark them individually so that all this information of the polar bear is referable to a single individual. We take blood samples to look at their condition, uh, to look at toxics levels in, in these polar bears. Tonight we are going to process all these samples taken from the polar bears and make them ready for storage. As mentioned on the video, the female bears are fitted with a, a collar around their neck, but male bears have a different um, head to neck size ratio, so the collar would actually just fall off. So they get fitted with uh, one of these ear tags instead. Uh, so the bears, when they're fitted with it, they don't notice, they, they just get up and get on with their, their day. So you can see this tracking information on the WWF website if you go to this uh, address you can see all the bears that have been tracked. This, this tracking information is used by scientists to establish the bears' movements to identify important habitats for them that can hopefully be protected. 
It also allows scientists to calculate if there are certain patterns of behaviour or times of the year that the bears go to human settlements in search of food. So we have our polar bear early warning detection system. This is an exciting new partnership with Aribada Initiative and Wild Labs. The idea behind it is that it would be a cost-effective heat sensing camera system that is designed to detect and identify individual species. It's at an early stage of development, but if the system can accurately identify polar bears and send a warning message to the mobile phones of people in Arctic settlements, it could be used by polar bear patrols to provide an early warning to keep settlements and polar bears safe. So this is just an image of what the polar bear would look, look like on the camera. The, the cameras have already been tested in Greenland in autumn 2018. And the project is now moving on to the second phase, working with the Highland Wildlife Park in Abbeymore to set up the cameras in their polar bear enclosure. The cameras will record images to further test the cameras and to record the movements of the bears in order to establish a baseline for the detection system. The baseline will be established by identifying distinguishable polar bear movements so the system can accurately identify the bears compared with other animals such as Arctic foxes and dogs to ensure the warning triggers are accurate. Once this phase of the project is complete, further testing will take place in the field in the Arctic. So this is just a short video. I was lucky enough to go up to the Highland Wildlife Park um, a few months ago when it was safe to meet Hamish the bear before he moved to his new home in Yorkshire and to see the camera in, being tested in real time. So you can see him moving around there. So the, the darker bits are the warmer areas and the lighter bits are where he's not so warm. So you can see he's losing a lot of heat from around his nose. So and it's quite clear that it is, a, it is a polar bear. So hopefully we'll gather more images like that to build up the system. Coupled with traditional knowledge from local peoples, uh, the results of all of these efforts are helping us to reduce human and bear conflict and to better understand and plan for the changing needs of this iconic animal. So thank you for listening. That was fantastic. That was really interesting. Um, we are lucky enough to have Rona here with us today to answer some of your questions. Hello, Rona. How are you? Morning. I'm fine. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Let's get cracked straight in with our first question. Let's see who we've got that sent something in for us today. So we have got P7 at Junar Primary asking, do you think polar bears will be extinct? And if so, when? That's quite a um, serious question to start off with. Uh, yes, it is, um, but it's a very um, interesting question as well. Um, unfortunately, a new study has predicted that polar bears could be extinct by the year 2100 if we uh, continue to release greenhouse gases at the same uh, the same as current levels. Um, so that does still sound like quite a long time in the future, but it's actually estimated that the polar bear population will start to suffer um, what is known as reproductive failure. Uh, that is, they're not producing enough um, baby bears to maintain the size of the population by 2040. So that's less than 20 years um, and we could start to be seeing the extinction of the polar bears if we don't start to cut our greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, and everyone loves to see baby bears as well. I know, they it's such a shame. Bears. Uh, yes. Let's see if we've got another question, hopefully one that's a wee bit less sad. What is something most people don't know about polar bears? Um, so I think most people probably don't realise that polar bears actually have black skin and the hairs... Um, their hairs are uh, translucent and hollow, so that allows them to absorb the uh, heat from the sun's rays um, and keep nice and warm. Um, but it, it sort of gives them that white appearance. So people think they're white, but actually they've got black skin. Um, and also because the hairs are hollow, it allows um, algae to grow in, in between the hairs. So sometimes polar bears can look a bit green if you see them in the wild, wow, which is quite funny. I did not know that about polar bears. That's <laughs> one. I've 
I'd love to see a green polar bear. That's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. All right. Do we have any other questions coming in? Are polar bears your favorite animal? If not, what is? That is a good question. That is a very good question, but also it's quite difficult to answer. So I think That's polar bears, one. yeah, they're definitely one of the favorite, um, one of my favorite animals, but it's really hard to pick a favorite. Um, obviously, as a marine biologist, I like anything uh, marine, anything that lives in the sea is a favorite. Um, but I do also have a bit of a soft spot for sloths. So um, <laughs> that's what one of my main favorite animals are sloths. So I encourage you to look them up if you haven't heard of them. They're very, very cute. Amazing. That's That was good choices. Bears and sloths are both very yes. good. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we have another question coming through. What is your favorite part of your job? That's a good question. Yeah, um, so I'm very lucky that I, uh, one of my favorite parts is actually I get to work with people all over the world um, because management of the polar regions and the research is carried out by uh, people in all different countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Uruguay, Chile, um, also the Arctic countries, Norway, um, Canada, America. So I'm very lucky that I get to work with um, all of these different people and hear different um, points of view and work that's going on uh, globally. So that's actually, that's one of my favourite parts of, of the job is uh, learning from all these people and hearing all the interesting work that's going on. Amazing, fantastic. So I think we have a YouTube question coming in next. Let's see what's happening here. All right, we have Andrew Lee and Callum Gordon asking, do you love otters? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, they're very um, interesting animals and I've been lucky enough to see them sometimes in the wild and they're so, uh, they're very cheeky and they're very cute. So yes, they I do love otters. They have the best wee hands. Their hands are so Yes, nice. yeah. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Um, do we have any other questions? All right, we have Elmville Primary P65 asking, where do you stay when you're in a polar region? Um, so people do, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, there are people who live in the polar regions. So you can, um, if you're lucky, you could stay with them. They have cabins um, that, that you can stay in. Um, some people do choose to camp as well so you can stay in tents which um i haven't done and to be honest i'm not sure if i would fancy it so um but that's another possibility so th there are places to stay or if you're a bit um braver you can sleep in a tent <laughs> holy moly that is yeah you'd have to be brave for that one yes all right fantastic thank you very much uh let's see what we've got next we have got saint benedict's primary p6a asking what inspired you to become a polar ocean specialist um well i've always um be, since i was uh, young and um, probably the same age as a lot of people on the call here i've always um loved wildlife and uh, the thought of conservation and i've always been fascinated by the polar regions um so i went on to study marine and freshwater biology and then just from that i've been lucky enough to work in different jobs um marine related jobs and then eventually i managed to um, get work, work with WWF and um, get the, the, the polar uh, specialist job. Um, so yeah, it's just it's something that I've always been interested in. It's such a fast, they're fascinating regions and it's fantastic to be able to, to be working on the conservation of them now. That sounded like you had a plan and you stuck to it all the way through. That's fairly yes. impressive. I'm not sure if I knew anything about what I wanted to do when I was that young. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Is the polar bear tracking satellite just used for polar bear tracking? Um, at the moment, that um, that system is just used for the polar bears, but obviously um, 
the tracking systems can be used for other animals. Um, for example, we do have a project in Antarctica where we're using uh, trackers to monitor penguins. And so the trackers are attached to the penguins' backs um, and they follow them around just to find out where they like to go and feed. Um, so those trackers actually also have a tiny camera on them. So the scientists can actually see what the penguins are eating as well as just knowing where they're going. So that's really uh, interesting. And hopefully that will allow us to identify area, important areas for penguins in the future that can be protected from um, human activity. Amazing. That sounds like what they did in the film Happy Feet. I think one of the penguins on that film had a yeah. tracker on his back. They must have been uh, following your research. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love Happy Feet. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Thank you very much. Let's see what we've got next. Uh, Junar Primary P7 asking, what qualifications do you need for your job? That's asked by Malmina and Maya. Um, so it can vary. Um, just from my own personal um, experience, um, I have a degree in marine and freshwater biology. Uh, so I actually studied at the University of Glasgow, so that's not far from the Science Centre. Um, I then went on and studied for a Master's in Aquatic Ecosystem Management. Um, at um, Napier University in Edinburgh and then um, I managed to get a job doing some practical fieldwork experience um, on research vessels and uh, uh, fishing vessels um, around Scottish waters and from that I was able to then get into the conservation side of things. Um, so, But it can vary, you can do different qualifications but that's what happened. Yeah, so you've got colleagues that probably took different routes to sort of get yes. the same destination. Yeah, they've maybe studied different subjects or sort of related subjects, but different and they've got slightly different experience. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other questions? Elmvale Primary P65 are asking, have you ever touched a polar bear? Uh, no, I personally have not ever touched a polar bear and um, I'm not sure I would want to get close enough to touch one if, they, if we weren't um, doing any tracking on them. Um, but I have been lucky enough when we went to the Highland Wildlife Park to be really close to the bears. They were just um, right next to us really, So, but I was still a bit too scared to actually put my hand up and touch touch at them um, because they, they can be even though they're really cute they can be quite uh, scary <laughs> as well sounds yeah. sensible they probably <laughs> trying to cuddle them as well yeah i wanted to keep all my fingers so amazing we have got another youtube comment coming up next i think it's from andrew and calm again uh what do what else do polar bears eat so if they can't get their favorite food what else would they have yes so um well i sort of mentioned that they they go scavenging so if they can't um find the seals that they like to eat then they'll go and uh, scavenge for anything that they can kind of find uh lying around um, in the summer as well, they can also get access to berries and things like that um, from the, the bushes around the place. So, yeah, basically they can they can't they can just eat anything if they if they can't find their favourite seal meal. Yeah, so they're yeah. not purely carnivore. They would get a bit of salad in there if they can yes. find anything else. Yeah, they get their five a day in as well. Yeah, they're probably better <laughs> at it than me. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have another one? What would happen if the Arctic wildlife were to go extinct due to climate change? Um, well, obviously, that would uh, be a horrible thing to happen. Um, it would impact on the ecosystem and the region as a whole, um, as well as having an impact on some regions further afield, because some of the species in the Arctic do migrate. So, for example, the Arctic Tern, we get the Arctic Tern around um, Scotland in the summer um, and then they, they feed on the fish. So if they were to disappear, that would have an impact on the ecosystem here. Um, it would be likely if the Arctic species disappeared that new species that live further south at the moment would be able to move up to where the Arctic regions are because they would be they wouldn't be as cold so they could survive. Um, so that that would sort of change the, the way that the Arctic looks as well. And it would also have a huge impact on the communities that live in the Arctic who rely on the specific Arctic species for food, clothing, and things like that, as well as 
it, it's an income for them when they can sort of uh, farm and sell yeah, things. So that would all be fairly significant. So it would probably change the, the landscape and the humans that yep. live there as well. That, yes, yes. Yes, that's quite wide ranging. Thank you very much. Um, do we have another question coming up here? What would you say to people who say that climate change in the Arctic doesn't concern them? Um, well, I think I said this in the presentation. So what I would say is that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So we well, we are all impacted by the rising temperatures, um, the loss in biodiversity, as I kind of explained in the last um, answer, and also the rising sea levels will also impact us here in Scotland. So we really all need to be concerned about it and all taking action. And um, just to you would need to just tell them that that's all backed up as well by scientific evidence it's um it is a real concern and we all need to do our bit fantastic yeah we certainly wouldn't want the sea levels to change too much here at the science center because we're right on sea level we might end up floating away yeah exactly <laughs> uh another question here what thing can the average scottish person do to help arctic wildlife um so the the main impact on the arctic wildlife is climate change as we've been discussing so our impact on climate change mostly comes from uh, what we eat and um, the sources of power that we're using for our homes and how we travel around so um what what you need to do is have a think about all of those things um you could walk or cycle to school um, instead of maybe getting a lift in the car, um, at least for a few days of the week. Um, and also have a think about the food that you're eating. Where is it coming from? Is it um, from a sustainable source? Um, and also, is it is it a locally produced um, piece of food or has it came from a long way away with a big climate footprint? So, so all those things, have a think about those, um, as well as uh, don't don't waste um, things, try and reuse and uh, you reuse things and recycle things as much as possible. Fantastic. Yeah, because some of our fish come from up near the Arctic Circle as well. And if we ate a lot of them, then there's going to be less for the polar bears to eat and things like that. Yes, exactly. You have to just uh, always have a wee think about, about where things come from. Yeah. Got to share with the polar bears. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other questions here? Uh, Elmville Primary P65 asking, how do you keep yourself warm in the polar regions? Well, there's um, you need to wear a lot of specialist um, equipment. Um, so you get a lot of uh, specialist clothing that uh, helps to keep you really warm um, and insulated when you're in the polar regions and make sure that you've got your your head and your hands and everything all covered in um, special boots and things like that to wear if you're outside um, to, to try and keep yourself cosy. That must be quite an interesting job for the people that have to design all of those sort of new clothes and comparing them to maybe what people have worn in the past because there's maybe a lot of local people that wear possibly fur from animals yep. whereas how does that compare to sort of synthetic materials that we would make in a lab? As well. Yes, I think um, yes. Yeah, traditionally, um, the Arctic communities would would be wearing um, fur um, from the from the animals and things like that. So that's yeah, interesting to compare. The yeah, difference. you can do some interesting experiments there and see what keeps you toastier. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have another question? Another one from Elmvale Elmvale Primary P six five. Do you use any machinery or tools? Um, in my day-to-day -day, uh, job, uh, not nothing particularly special, but um, like we mentioned in the presentation, uh, we do have a few projects where we're using technology, um, cameras um, and things like that, as well as the um, machinery, or it's not really machinery, but the uh, tools that we need to tag the polar bears um, and things like that. So it's more... Um, technological uh, machinery, I suppose, is what you would say that we would use. Yeah, and how does that technology cope with those very frosty temperatures? Do they rely on polar bear heat to keep them still working or do they have to be specially made to cope with the cold temperatures? 
Um, I think they're all specially made to to be able to withstand the really cold temperatures, um, so they're quite well um, insulated and things like that to make sure that they can continue to work um, in the in the freezing cold. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine being able to have like big thick gloves on and being able to easily press small buttons on a phone or a, a laptop or something yes. like that. That's I think it takes a lot of practice. Think. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, do we have another question here? St. Benedict's again, P6A, asking what animal intrigues you the most? So maybe something you don't know as much about as you, you'd like to. That's, um, yeah, that's a, an excellent question. Um, I think in the Arctic, maybe one animal that intrigues me the most is the narwhal. Um, it's sort of another one of my favourites, but it's an animal that we still don't really know that much about. Um, so I think I also mentioned that we just recently discovered that the um, that the horn that looks like a unicorn is actually it's a long tooth. Um, so it's really a, a fascinating creature that we we still don't know that much about, and it would be great to to find out more about them yeah I definitely didn't believe they were a real animal until I, I was an adult I thought yeah. they were like a unicorn and they were fictional yes um, yeah. yeah I would like to know more, more about narwhals as well I've heard that some people think their tooth can be used kind of like sonar and it can detect vibrations from fish and things like yes that. yeah or they use it to um to sort of hit the fish so that they can um, eat it more easily. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating creature. Um, yeah, it's like a, a sword. Yes. A yeah. Or a medieval type of weapon. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions that we have got coming up here? Have you always been interested in working in the fight against climate change? So we know you're always interested in sort of wildlife life and conservation, but what about climate change? Um, yeah, so when I was at primary school, which was quite a long time ago now, I was actually, um, it was my birthday a couple of weeks ago and I just turned 34. So I seem ancient to quite a lot of people listening, I'm sure. But even when I was at primary school, we were being taught about climate change and how things, we would have to do things differently. Um, so yes, it's something that has always interested me. And it's, in a way, it's quite sad that um, back the, in the 1990s, people were getting taught about climate change and the things that we had to do to address climate change. But those things still haven't really been done and they haven't been done um, fast enough. So what we really need is for, um, the government to listen and to make the changes that we know have to be made um, now. Yes. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm very similar in age to yourself. And I rem remember at primary school them talking about, oh, we'll have to do something about climate change in the future. Otherwise, things will get bad as opposed to we need to do stuff now to <laughs> stop things getting any worse. Yeah, so I think it's maybe a bit different for those that are watching today to maybe what we learned when we were at school. Yep. We're just so old. Um, oh, no. <laughs> do we have any other questions before we get into sad old uh, mindset? What would happen if the Arctic wildlife were to go extinct due to climate change? So we have sort of answered a similar question to this. Um, so if we're to think, we know that you said some wildlife would move up the ways because things yep. are warmer uh, when you're talking about like the krill that you talked about right at the start and um, what about if small animals like that were to disappear would that have any effect on the arctic wildlife um yes so um the antarctic krill um live in the antarctic um Sorry. but that's no that's fine because there are there are similar so um Antarctic krill is known as zooplankton. So phytoplankton and zooplankton are the sort of uh, building blocks for the food chain um, in, in, all the, in all regions, so in the Arctic Ocean as well. So if the species like that were to disappear, the whole, um, the whole food chain would collapse. Uh, so that would have a really massive impact on all of the species that live um, in, the, in the Arctic Ocean. Because yeah. they're sort of yeah the the main they're sort of known as keystone species and if they were to disappear the whole system would collapse. Um, a lot of 
the is it the phytoplankton in the sea are they responsible for absorbing quite a lot of the carbon dioxide we create as well yes that's right so they so work they um they photosynthesize dioxide levels yes yes so they photosynthesize in the same way that plants and trees do so they take in uh, the carbon from the atmosphere and um, to produce their own energy so they play a really important role in uh, absorbing the carbon as well yes we don't want anything going anything more going in extinct you know the dinosaurs were bad enough or they could have dinosaur pets we don't want anything <laughs> else going extinct yes exactly Fantastic. Thank you. Do we have any other questions coming up? What has caused the best positive response from the public with regards to Arctic awareness? Um, so generally, the uh, members of the public really love to hear about um, our icon, the iconic species like polar bears. Um, and they also they love to hear about uh, innovative solutions for how we're trying to help them. So we have had a really um, good reaction when we speak to people about the heat sensing cameras that I spoke about in the presentation. People really um, connect to that. They love to hear about practical solutions um, to how we're actually helping uh, to helping to conserve uh, the Arctic and the species that live there. Um, because that's what's needed. We need um, solutions and things to help rather than just sort of talking about the problems all the time. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be really good if from this session today, maybe someone gets inspired to think of another solution that could help wildlife in the Arctic. Yes, I did wonder definitely. when you were talking about the cameras in your presentation, do the cameras still work in the snow or do they just see snow or can they still see polar bears? Um, because they are heat sensitive, they can, they should still be able to detect the heat from the polar bears, um, even through thick snow. But obviously that's something that has to be tested as well, because it is still in the trial period of, uh, of the cameras. So mm -hmm. that's something that, um, that the uh, people who are running the project are going to be looking at as well. Yeah, I suppose it's still better than having sort of guards, like humans doing the job all the time. It's better if you can just send a camera out to do the job. Yes. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, do we have another question? Oh, I like this one. What futuristic innovations could you imagine would help animals in the Arctic? So something that maybe doesn't exist yet, but in a future, yeah. maybe it will. Um, well, maybe something, so obviously maybe extrapolating from, we've got drones at the moment that can go anywhere um, that humans can't. So maybe there's something um, that could happen with drones. There can be cameras tracking, maybe live tracking of animals um, as they, they're going about their business would be quite interesting. Um, as well as using the sort of combining all of the technology that we've got into something really easy to use that can give us some really detailed information. Um, also, we there's some been really good advances in um, genetic uh, testing and things like that. So that could be another thing that could help us because the more that we know about an animal, the better we can help it. So. That would be that's something else to think about for the future that does sound really positive okay i think we have time for one last question from one of our schools today and that is elmville primary again what do you do in your spare time in the polar regions that's an interesting one yes so um just uh, try not to get too cold um, usually you just have to kind of do the same things that you would maybe do if you were at home do some uh, reading um, maybe analyze the scientific information that you've collected in the day um, or yes yeah, sort of just the same things that you would maybe do when you were at home because obviously you can't really go out for a sort of a nice random walk in the freezing cold temperatures so you sort of just relaxing and um, trying to just uh, think about what, maybe plan out what you're going to do for the next day or two um, if you're there to do some research or something like that. 
Amazing. Thank you very much. That was so many questions you were able to answer for us today. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And your presentation was absolutely fantastic. Um, so that was our last question. And that is us coming to the end of our presentation and our session today. So thank you very, very much, Rona. And I think if people want to find out more, they can head over to the Curious About Festival website. Or can they head over to a WWF website as well to find out more? I assume. Yes, we've got um, our website as well for any information that they want to find out. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. So we will leave you to go and save the polar bears and change the world. All right. <laughs> and that is all from us here at Glasgow Science Centre. Join us for some of our other sessions today back here on YouTube or wherever you're viewing us from today. And thank you very much and goodbye.